Welcome to our second show, episode, not sure what to call it, of Democracy Matters. Uh, for those of you who joined us uh, the first time around, thank you so much when we talked about Medicare. Uh, and we have our guest, Natasha Perez, back again for uh, our second show talking about Social Security. Um, so welcome back, Natasha. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And we're going to actually start with a little bit of some updates about New Hampshire Citizens Alliance. I am a community organizer with New Hampshire Citizens Alliance. Um, and our organization is a 35-year-old nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that works uh, in education and advocacy on issues of social, economic, and political justice. So the, the issues that we work on as an organization are the issues that we want to bring to the table in this show, Democracy Matters. Because democracy does matter. Um, it matters that we talk about these issues, and it matters that we uh, realize how important it is that we are all recognizing that we need to be active responsible members of this democracy to make it work. Because as Natasha and I both know, there's a lot of ways in which sometimes it doesn't feel like our democracy works very well. Um, that's why as we talk on this show, we're going to always be giving you ideas for action, the kinds of actions that you can take on the state and the federal level uh, to be able to participate fully in this democracy. Um, we're going to start something new on our second show um, already, and that is to begin with a update of the kinds of things that New Hampshire Citizens Alliance has been working on, paying attention to, um, and then we'll move into talking with Natasha about Social Security, and then we'll wrap up with talking about action that you can take on a variety of issues. So by way of update, one thing that New Hampshire Citizens Alliance is really proud of is that we have been for the last year a one of the cohorts or one of the 10 nonprofit organizations that have participated in the state in what's called the HIVE pilot. Now, the HIVE is H-I-V-E. It stands for High Impact Volunteer Engagement. And New Hampshire Citizens Alliance is working on a statewide leadership team creating hubs in different communities to be able to bring, to build capacity of the organization and to bring the advocacy to the communities. We realize that not everybody can get to Concord at the State House to be able to be taking the kind of actions that we're going to be talking about at towards the end of the show. So this pilot program that we have participated in for the last year was a real honor and we are very happy to have worked with nine other organizations to have really begun to see volunteerism in the state in in somewhat of a new light and um, we'll, we talk about volunteerism a lot. It, organizations like the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare, which is the organization that Natasha works with, and New Hampshire Citizens Alliance, and many nonprofits that you all may work with, really work or don't work, depending on volunteerism. So um, we're very happy to have been part of that Hive initiative and are going to continue this great work. So anybody out there who's interested in bringing your skills to bear on um, our organizations, on the organizations of our partners, um, please, there's contact information at the end of the show um, that you can refer to. Um, also wanted to let you know that um, tonight, uh, my colleague, Olivia Zink, another community organizer, is launching her seventh season of a women's leadership training. And this is six uh, evenings, uh, Monday nights, the uh, consecutive Monday nights. So tonight on St. Patrick's Day, of course, I almost forgot to mention that, um, is the first of the six. And they cover a, a variety of topics. She had 45 people sign up 
for this leadership training, which is going to be in Concord this time. And so it is open. It's free. You can go to our website, NewHampshireCitizensAlliance.org, uh, for more information. If you get e-blast from us, um, you know, you'll usually see in the sidebar some of the kind of information about things that are going on. Um, another update is that those of you who are signing up for health care through the marketplace, the health marketplace, um, just a reminder that March 31st is the close of the open enrollment period. So if you haven't gotten on to healthcare.gov and checked out what's available to you, you better get moving <laughs> because we have um, just a little over a week. Well, I'll have two weeks to go in that enrollment period. And in order to support this enrollment effort, New Hampshire Citizens Alliance is hosting navigators and marketplace assisters in our office every day between now and the 31st. So you can always call our office, find out when somebody is going to be on site that can help you. It's free, it's confidential. We do have Spanish speaking navigators there um, and we can, we'll, we'll put the, if you check the calendar on our website, the actual information is on there as well. And we have good news that um, last week, I think it was, maybe two weeks ago, I don't know, time passes so fast, um, the Senate did pass a piece of legislation, Senate Bill 413, which deals with the issue of Medicaid expansion. They're not calling it that. It's called the Health Protection Program, and it was passed in the Senate, and that is what we've been talking about with Medicaid expansion, which basically allows us to utilize $2.4 billion, I believe it is, that is available to us. It's our money as taxpayers that is coming back to us that will provide uh, medical assistance for our uh, uh, people in our state. It's about 50,000 people in the state who will benefit by having um, affordable and in some cases free health care. There were five senators who didn't vote in favor of this and um, I have been getting a call from people to know who those senators are. So um, I will tell you, the senators who did not vote for this program were Senator Sanborn, Senator Carson, who I believe is the senator of this area, Senator Prescott, Senator Catalo, and Senator Reagan. So because people have been asking, wanted to let you know that it is going to, the, the legislation is now in the House, uh, House Committee, the Finance Committee, and tomorrow that committee will be making a decision on what they're going to recommend to the full house and they're anticipating by the end of next week they will have voted completely across the board ready for the governor's signature on what we're referring to as Medicaid expansion or the health protection program. Um, and then it's expected that we'll say when it passes that people who otherwise maybe went on healthcare.gov and weren't able to find anything affordable, those were probably people who were in the gap that make less than 100% of the federal poverty level. So if you went on healthcare.gov already, didn't find anything affordable, pay attention to the news, and after next week, go back on healthcare.gov, get with uh, some of the navigators and the assisters, and find out if you qualify for the, the new program. Um, there's some other updates, but I'm gonna save them because Natasha's been patiently <laughs> waiting here. Um, again, I just wanna thank Natasha for being here. Um, the, pro the organization that Natasha is a field, um, a regional organizer on is the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. Last time we talked, we talked about Medicare.
Today we're going to talk about medic. I'm sorry about social security. Um, we partner. Our organizations partner. Natasha's organization works a lot on federal issues. Our organization, depending on what issue, we work both federally and state. But on social security and Medicare, and we Medicaid. tend. Did I say Medicaid and Medicaid, and Medicaid as well? Um, we tend to partner with the National Committee. So, Natasha, I always, as you know, <laughs> I always think it's important. Not everybody knows the background of so, where this, where did Med, where did Social Security start? You know, kind of bring us up to like today. Today, I Good. can do that. Okay. Karen, thank you so much for having me here again, and thank you for the partnership that the National New Hampshire Citizens Alliance and the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare have working on issues of importance for people in New Hampshire every day. Um, and I just want to sort of go back to something you said in the beginning about volunteers. Without volunteers, programs like yours and mine would not exist and we would not be able to do the great work we've done. And so people really need to volunteer because right now the time is so important on issues like Social Security and Medicare. And uh, so as Karen has said, the numbers are on the screen at the end of the show and we hope people will um, call one of our organizations and work with us right. to make these things happen. Um, Social Security. So how did Social Security start in the first place? Well, Prior to 1935, in the late, in the early 1930s, as you know, um, seniors were living in poverty, huge amounts of poverty. The, the Great Depression was beginning to happen, and many people lost all their life savings, and seniors were living on the street. And essentially what happened was the federal government, uh, uh, led by Roosevelt, said, we need to do something mm -hmm. about this. Seniors should be able to live out their lives with respect and dignity. Um, and Social Security was created in 1935. Today, Social Security, and over that time, Social Security has actually changed. People don't know that. They think it was created in 1935 and it's changed. And it, it, stayed, this, it mm -hmm. stayed static. It's actually changed a lot as our society has changed and women have entered the workforce, people have come off the farms. Um, after the war, uh, when um, uh, men weren't coming back from the war, they expanded it to uh, widower's benefits. So you can see, as our Social Security has always been this very dynamic program, and it's changed as our society has changed. You're right. I don't think most people think of it that way. It's like it was a program that was created and, you know. No, it's... But it's, that's a very good thing to point out. And actually what's really interesting, it's always had people trying to get rid of it. So even when Social Security was started, they were saying that um, it would drive people out of the workforce. None of those things have come to fruition. And now Social Security is one of the most successful retirement programs in our country. Um, and very, an important piece of the, what people consider the three-legged stool of retirement. And that includes Social Security, mm -hmm. pensions, and savings. Okay. Now, as we know, many companies don't offer pensions anymore. And with many people having lost their jobs, savings, a lot of people don't have savings. So unfortunately for many people, Social Security is the only leg in their retirement school in stool. As a matter of fact, that number is actually about 1.5 out of three people rely on wow. Social Security for their only retirement income. And my guess is that that number, that percentage, or has probably gone up over the last. Yes, few years, it was hasn't originally. It? it was originally. That's like 50 percent. Yeah, it was originally one in three. But now mm -hmm. it's moved up, and a lot of that is due to, as I said, companies no longer offering pensions, um, and or or companies that went bankrupt and employees lost their pensions, 
and also the fact that we've been in recession and people have lost their jobs, so their savings are less. Mm -hmm. That number has indeed gone up, and the number is actually higher for women and African Americans. So um, more women and African Americans mm -hmm. rely on Social Security solely. Well, for their retirement income. You know, I was just, uh, because my husband has a big Irish clan, we were at his family's uh, over the weekend um, in celebration of St. Patrick's Day and was talking to his father, who is 80 years old, and had part of a, a car dealer in, uh, empire for 72 years, I believe it is, and I was telling him about the show that we were doing, and he said, well, I'm the perfect example here because here's a, a family business for 72 years that everything seemed like it was, you know, neat and tidy, figured out so that everybody, you know, the business could keep going, people could retire out of the business and have a good pension, and... A few years ago, it all went very much downhill, and the money that he expected to get out of the business, well, the business is no more, sadly. And so he relies, they rely completely on their Social Security, and they made some, you know, retirement plans beyond the business, but he... he just really underscored as a person in his 80s how critical it is. It's not just for, a lot of times people think of the social network systems like Medicare and Social Security for people who didn't, you know, didn't do their due diligence. And he was a great example of someone who had it all planned out, but sometimes the bottom falls out of things. And so the fact that that three-legged stool that you talked about, Social Security is the most secure leg of that <coughs> stool for many people. And the bottom doesn't really have to fall out. The fact is, if you're in, whether you're a teacher or a firefighter or you work in your local grocery store, um, the fact is the amount of money you will have to be able to save is limited and if that job does not come with a pension then you're limited with those other two stools and many people mm -hmm. work their whole lives and still end up with only social security as their retirement income and to just give you an idea of how little that is <laughs> the actual benefit the average benefit for social security is fourteen thousand five hundred a year and if you remember we talked about Medicare last week Medicare a portion of it comes out of Social Security so the average amount that comes out is around five thousand four hundred so if you think about that for a minute a lot of people are living on only nine thousand uh, dollars a year and the federal poverty level is see if I remember this right, 11,490. So that, even though Social Security is a program to bring people out of poverty, it sounds like anyone who's relying just on Social Security is actually still considered in poverty and... and right, but with, without it, think of where those people would be today. So it's hugely huge it's hugely important and it's hugely important in New Hampshire um, in New Hampshire 172,050 569 people receive retirees receive mm -hmm. Social Security but the other thing that people don't know about Social Security is Social Security is not just a program for retirees it's actually a program for families mm -hmm. Remember I talked about how the program had, sh had shifted and when um, men were not coming back from war, women received widower's benefits. Mm -hmm. So um, one in seven people actually do not make it to the age of 67. Um, in a couple, that person's benefits then go to their widow. The, all of their benefits? A portion of their mm -hmm. benefits goes to the widow. And... Um, that number in New Hampshire is 15,853. 
which get widower's benefits. Mm -hmm. Also, if the person dies, some of their benefits go to their children. It actually goes to the family to help them survive. Is the that if they have happening. dependent children at yes, that point? Yes, at that time, uh -huh. yes. And in, in New Hampshire, again, that's 21,470,000 um, children that receive benefits from Social Security. And so what is that? We're talking about somewhere around two to 300,000 people in New Hampshire who, between those survivor benefits Widowers, and the children. retirees, yeah. and then we add disabled. Oh, okay. Many people become disabled before mm -hmm. they get to retire, and then they get disabled benefits. Through Social Security. Through Social Security. Because there Security. are also benefits through Medicaid, but that would be just for their medical, That right? would be just okay. for their medical. Social Security um, pays for the disabled. So you can, again, see this is, Social Security is not just a program about retirees. It's a program about families. It is a social insurance program. It's, you pay into it your whole life, and in the end, it protects you. Um, so many people want to know, so what do people pay into Social Security? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. You pay. Glad you asked your own question. <laughs> Thank you, Natasha. <laughs> I do my best. Um, six, you pay 6.2% out of your paycheck. Okay. And that's your FICA tax, and uh -huh. your employer pays 6.2%, totaling 12.5%. Four percent. You have to work 40 quarters, they're called, to receive Social Security. Once you get to that 40 quarters, you'll receive the Social Security. So is benefit. that 10 years then? Is that how? Yeah, it's yeah. about 10 years. I'm, I'm such a math genius. I figured that <laughs> right out. Um, but, but that's important for people to know because, like, I think my sister-in-law works in a school system that is, is self-contained somehow so that she actually doesn't get Social Security? Is that, that's, that's, that's the way some of them work, right? Yes, it, some states, very few at this point, but some states, teachers do not get Social Security because they're on a different system. Mm -hmm. Okay. But most people are on the Social Security system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you talked about the fact that um, since it, was created, there's always been efforts to bring it down. Yes. So um, tell us a little bit about, about that. Well, people will, oh, it's not going to be there. It's insolvent. It's not going to be there for me. Part of that is a big, uh, it's an effort by those who want to privatize the program to say it's not going to exist. The reality is Social Security is going to be there. It takes us working to make sure it is there, but it's going to be there. And they use the idea that Social Security is insolvent. Social Security is. Meaning it's broke. Meaning it's right? broke. Right. And, and so there's a scare thing that says, okay, someone like me who's, you know, a few years away that, um, you know, there's not going to be money there for me. Right. And that's just not true. Social Security is solvent to 2033. Okay. 20, if we do nothing. If we do nothing. If we do nothing okay. at all, it's, so, it's solvent for the next 20 years. After that, it can pay 75% of benefits, right? So with small changes, we can extend Social Security into in perpetuity, right? Mm -hmm. okay. One of the things is people like, Social Security is going solvent. Social Security is looked at every year, and it's a 75-year actuarial. So what that means is they've known what Social Security insolvency is going to be for a long time. There's no surprises. Oh. There's no shocks, right? So those who say we're in crisis, it's going insolvent, that's just a way to get people to not support the program. But there's no real basis in it. So if, um, you know, so we have this 75-year window where smart people who are actuaries are looking at all of the dynamics of our birth rates, things like that. Yeah, and they're they're figuring it out. Um, uh, so some people are going, "Oh, it's insolvent," and we. I'm trying to put together the idea that anyone who wants to change it would make cuts to it because it seems like that would be like the worst possible thing that you could do 
you know, I mean, that just seems counterintuitive. It, well, it certainly is counterintuitive. And I'll talk more about how we can sort of expand the solvency, um, which is sort of different. There's two things. I want to okay. cut your benefits and give you less. Okay. Oh, okay. All <laughs> There's right. I so. want to cut your benefits. There's um, the federal government has looked at cutting the money to, to balance the budget. So taking benefits from you that don't protect Social Security to balance the budget. Um, but before we go to that, mm -hmm. I want to say a lot of people have heard this saying um, they took the money. The money has been taken from Social Security. It's not there. It doesn't really work that way. Um, the way Social Security works is people pay into Social Security. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just sit in a bank. Okay. Although if it was in that bank, it's about 4.2 uh, trillion dollars in Social Security. So a lot of people must want to get their hands Love on that, that money. But money, just like any other money we have, doesn't just sit in a bank. Mm -hmm. What happens is the government borrows that money in U.S. Treasury bonds. Mm -hmm. Those are one of the most stable bonds in the, in the world. Foreign governments buy them, corporations buy them, because they're, they're, they're very stable. They're backed by the U.S. government. So if the U.S. government can't pay back the money to Social Security that it's borrowed, we have a lot of other problems. So what, I can where the money is, it's, it's within the system, right? It doesn't sit in a bank. Your money doesn't sit in a bank. My money doesn't sit in a bank. It's in the system, right? But it's right. available to us when we mm -hmm. want to go to the bank and pull it out. Right, right. And we know it's there. Social Security works the same Similar. way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, it's, it's separate from the federal budget. It's offline. Social Security is a pay-as-you-go system. The money goes in and the money goes out. So just like that bank, Social Security is saying, okay, we're going to loan you this money with the idea when it comes due, you pay us back, just like any other bank. Mm -hmm. So it makes it very different than the federal budget. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? The, okay. the government's budget. Okay. So people don't, they think it's the same thing. They're actually very different. And it's run by the Social Security Trust Fund. Okay. And, and, and it is separate. But there separate. are those who are politically involved who, uh, are, are they trying to, are they wanting to cross those lines somewhat? Yes, they absolutely want to cross the lines. And you know, one of the things that has shifted greatly is Social Security has always been sort of the third rail of politics, mm -hmm. that we couldn't touch it. What has shifted is there's been a growing voice on the other side that says, we're in a deficit. We need to be able to pay back the deficit, right? And where are we going to get the money from? And they say to themselves, Social Security. Oh, there's four point. Two trillion dollars sitting there, sort of. Right. Yeah. Why not Available. go? Mm -hmm. Why not go to Social Security? It's like, why did Jesse James rob banks? Because that's where the money was. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Um, so there are those who look at Social Security that way, but the fact is, Social Security has not contributed one penny to the deficit. It can't by law. Many people don't know that. By law, Social Security cannot contribute to the deficit. It is a self funding program. It is insurance and it is self-funding. That's why it actually has a solvency. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, it's 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 interesting a little bit. Um, well, like many things that when politics get involved, it starts feeling complicated and it seemed like, you know, it was a good program. It's sort of freestanding and then it you start getting political, and then it's like, okay, well, we're going to um, cut people's benefits. Um, uh, I think you answered the question of whether it's actually going broke. It's it's not. There's a plan in place, um, and maybe maybe you, is there more to say about what some of the plans are? Yeah. To have it become solvent beyond seventy five percent. Before I talk years. about um, what some, some of the plans are to go solvent, I'd like to talk about what um, they've been talking about in Congress. Okay. Because what they have been talking about in Congress is really cutting Social Security to pay for the deficit. 
Okay. Taking the money that you have paid in your whole life and using it to balance the budget, even though that okay. money has not contributed to the deficit. Right. So let's talk about what they've wanted to do to reduce benefits. One thing they've talked about is increasing the age of Social Security to 70. It is currently um, 67. That change came in 1983 um, with a set of changes where it went from 65 to 67, phased in over 45 years. And is the age the same for men and women? Yes. Okay. Now, it, it hasn't changed, right? Okay. So, I mean, it. it so we're not at the 45 years yet, so it's still incrementally going up to 67. Okay. They'd like to change the age to 70 um, so that you would get your benefits later, thus shortening the amount of benefits you would get. This is a big problem. But similar to what we talked about with Medicare, right? I mean, to expect people to continue employment at the same level at so many, a few more years it's it's and and again maybe if you're sitting in a desk all day um, but the fact is in places like new hampshire and vermont and maine and new england people work outdoors mm -hmm. they're nurses they're firefighters they're police they're teachers those per people are not necessarily going until they're 70. The other problem we have is that age discrimination in the workplace is alive mm. and well. And we talked about it in Medicare. The individual who is older tends to, because of health care costs, place a lot of additional costs on a company. Mm -hmm. So seniors are the first to go. I mean, the fact is pe companies say to themselves, why pay for someone who's 70 and is making 65000 a year when I can pay for someone who's 25 mm -hmm. and <laughs> only pay them 30000 a year without the health care costs. So these are decisions that get made every day. And the idea, you know, the idea was, well, people are living longer. Why shouldn't we do that? The fact is, some people are living longer, um, but Native Americans, minorities, um, and whites in rural poverty areas are not living as long. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is some justification for it, but that was addressed between six, moving it to 67. So, um, just coming back, so originally it was for 65, 65 and it, there was a 45 year plan that is still. In 1983 was the last time under the Greenspan Commission that they made changes to it. Okay. And it was to expand the solvency. It was focused only on expanding the solvency of the program. Okay. Again, this is very different than using the money, the federal government not paying back the money it owes Social Security to balance the budget. Right. This current change they've talked about, moving it to 70, is about balancing the budget. It's not about making sure that the program remains solid. Okay. Okay. Wow. So uh, the, that gets that yep. gets crazy. The other thing they've talked about um, is privatizing Social Security. Um, we've been hearing this for years. Mm -hmm. It was got very big in the '90s um, under Bush. He was a big advocate of privatizing mm -hmm. Social Security. Paul Ryan, who is currently in Congress, mm -hmm. has supported. Um, privatizing Social Security and bought up proposals. Mm -hmm. um, there are a multitude of proposals for actually privatizing it. One is that, you know, 2% would remain in Social Security and then the rest of it you would be allowed to use on the market. Now, so it would completely go out of the the Social Security Trust Fund Social coffers. insurance. It would lose its social insurance nature. Well, what's the problem yeah. with this? Well, first of all, <laughs> I can see a lot of problems. You can with see that. a lot of problems. Imagine yeah. for the for the audience out there. Imagine if you if our Social Security had been privatized, and you were nearing sixty five or at sixty five, if all your money were tied up in the market, you would have lost 
a 50, at least a 50% valuation on that money going into 65 and your ability to recover that, you wouldn't have that ability. So let's say my money's in the market at 30, we had the market crash, I have some time to recover. But those people nearing 65 who are then drawing on that amount, right, because they're no longer adding in, right. they're drawing on it. So once you start drawing off that money, it's not growing in the same way. So their ability, they would not have anything. They would have lost 50% of everything, and there would be no guarantee in the end. The other thing is, the fact is, it takes money to invest. If you're, right. if you're investing a small portion, what a lot of people don't know is there are certain funds you don't even have access to. There mm -hmm. are certain thresholds right. right, that you have to reach in terms of the amount of money you can actually use to even get into set certain categories of investment. So our poor person or our person who's a regular working person has a lot less access and ability to invest their, their, their money wisely and most people who, if you have a lot of money, you have people who invest the money for you, that costs money. So there's all these other things that impact a person's ability to invest their own money. Well, also, I mean, I can, I can look at my own situation. I have had, as a single mom for many years, lived very close, you know, to the bone. And the fact that that money was going out and it was not a choice for me as a responsible person, but who had to figure out how to make ends meet. Um, I mean, I imagine that the people who want to privatize it have some kind of a safeguard that, you know, that that, nope, no safeguards. No safeguards. Okay. <laughs> so basically they're saying, so here you go, here's your paycheck and good luck, but we hope you'll put 6.2% of it away because that's your social security. Right. It kind of defeats the purpose because people either do that or they don't with their own money anyway, don't they? I mean, savings accounts, yeah. retirements accounts, IRAs, Roth IRAs. I agree, but as you ones. said, most people live paycheck to paycheck. That's yeah. the reality and how much savings are there at the end of it. Yeah. The fact is, inflation has grown, but the average wage has not grown. So people are trying to do more with less all the time. So how seriously are these proposals, you know, I mean, I, I think, I mean, they, they don't seem like a very good idea, well, you know, the, if, unless, as we're sitting here talking about it. So how do they gain traction? They gain traction because, as I talked about earlier, there's this heavy campaign saying Social Security won't be there for me. Mm -hmm. And fear. Fear fear that it's not going to be there and without volunteers and without us having a voice saying no we don't accept this people with money and power and corporations that hey think this is a great idea imagine the market having all this ad extra money people in the market they want to play with your money right and oh i guess you know if it's not there it's not there that's the risk of the market um so unfortunately these proposals gain momentum a lot and it takes us fighting every day mm. saying no we won't accept this social security is an important part of our retirement and it should be left alone well and I think um, what I find and I'm sure it's the case in social security is a lot of these things are very complicated and so you get politicians who are not only using these fear mongering or words like entitlement when it's really a social uh, insurance and earned benefit and, right um and i think that it can become very intimidating to i mean i have worked on this issue really only a tiny tiny bit i work medicaid expansion here in the state um i you know i have a master's degree but you get into the the weeds and the details, and it really doesn't take much for some politician to come here and talk about it and scare me, you know, scare scare us, and throw out a lot of numbers, a lot of details that, as an average person, I don't have the time, um, 
sort of the inclination to try to fact check, you know, everything right. that they're saying. But it can it can be very overwhelming and intimidating. And it is, but yeah. I I think it's really simple, Karen. I think what people need to remember is they paid into it their whole lives and it's there for them when they retire. It's there for their family and ah, it's there if good. something happens to them. So if they, a politician is gambling <laughs> on to them, they can just go, I paid in, I get to get it out. I exactly. paid in and just simplify. I and, like that. And That's they, great. A lot of times the politicians say they try to pit you know, seniors against young people saying, uh, yeah. well, you're bankrupting the children if you get your Social Security retirement. But that's not the reality. The fact is, again, it's for families. It's not just for seniors. And it disregards the fact that today many grandparents take care mm -hmm. of their kid, yeah. grand ch kids, yeah. and so they're supporting that way. And many of us um, we're the sandwich gen generation, right? So many women step out of the workforce to take care of their grandparents, mm -hmm. right? right? And it helps right. support the whole family. This idea that one is taking from another is, again, mm. just a way to attack the program. I want to talk about one other thing that's out there okay. is because it was, they were talking about it a lot with something called the chain CPI. Right. Okay. What the chain CPI did was say, and it was a way to, again, cut benefits, and they were going to use it to balance the budget. What the chain CPI said is, hey, you know what? If you're a chain CPI, the consumer price index is determined by a basket of goods, right? Okay. The labor, labor department comes up with a statistic. It's how they determine a cost of living adjustment okay. or a COLA. For okay. people on Social Security, it's a COLA. Cola. For people in the workplace, it's a COLA, okay. right? Cost of living adjustment. adjustment. The, and consumer price index. So the consumer price index determines what a basket of good costs you when you okay. go to the store. And that's how they determine how much your COLA is going to be, how much okay. more you're going to get, right? Mm -hmm. What they were saying is, okay, you know what? If hamburger is too expensive, you're going to buy chicken. So you know what? We're not going to... We're not going to change the consumer price index at all. We're going to chain it. We're literally going to leave it where it is. What that meant in real dollars for seniors is $140 the first year you retire. Over 20 years, about $1,400. That they don't get. That they don't get. So now, cutting that's their Social, social Security, Security benefits. That, and that's a significant that's amount for significant. people. Um, why doesn't the, so the consumer price index that I talked about, that labor basket of goods, it's based on a working person. Mm -hmm. That's why it doesn't really work for seniors. Because seniors spend, so it includes entertainment, education, health care, mm -hmm. um, uh, electricity, gas, those sort of things. Um, a, a working person has a very different basket than the senior. A working person or a younger person is not spending the same on health care. Right. <coughs> Seniors spend the most of their money on health care, uh, oil, and, mm -hmm. and gas, and, mm -hmm. and mortgage or rent. Right? That's where the majority of their money goes into. That's a very different basket than a younger person's basket. Right. That's so good. It, versus mm -hmm. on entertainment and food or right. education and things like that. So seniors, that basket is fixed. You just can't decide t tomorrow, and we can say it because this morning was cold in New Hampshire, right? <laughs> and so we all know that that, ga that oil heat that we hoped we weren't filling another tank um, uh, after February, we're definitely filling another tank. That's a fixed price. That doesn't change. You can't right. decide today, okay, I'm not going to pay my oil bill or I'm only going to give my oil guy uh, $200 yeah, instead of the 400 I owe him, right? right. It, doesn't, it work. doesn't work. I can't say I'm not going to pay my rent or my mortgage or I'm going to tell the bank, oh, you know what? Today I'm only going to pay you this much because right. it's too expensive. And, you know, it's the same with health care. If a prescription costs so much, it's not like you can decide not to take the prescription. Right. So and that's it's dangerous what, when they do, right. when people do. So as a matter of fact, people think th there should be a different CPI for the elderly, and it's called CPIE. 
And what it actually does is it looks at the basket of goods that seniors use and it says, says, okay. It's a different basket. It's a different goods. basket. And what is the cost of living adjustment? And again, for, for people out there, I know people know this, look at how much health care has gone up. Look at how much utilities have gone up. You know, these are things that are moving up, not down, and it, you can't switch them out. So that's an important change. We, New Hampshire C uh, Citizens Alliance for Action and uh, National Committee to Preserve Social Security worked very hard to fight. And I'm proud to say after two years, it got taken out of the president's budget this time around. Ve Thank you for that hard work. Uh, you know, all of our efforts across this state in New Hampshire and visiting the senator and visiting the congresswoman mm -hmm. and saying, no, this is, we won't accept these cuts have finally gotten to us to a place where now hopefully, at least for a short time, we can actually f work on social security's solvency. So that's what we've been fighting and it's been a really hard battle. Um, as you know, I don't know how many times you and I have stood out in the cold with signs <laughs> in, front, in front of Senator Ayotte's office and others saying, do not cut Social Security, but they have really, it's been a real fight. So what, you know, what happens going forward? So let's talk about that solvency okay. issue. And I'm just noticing we have a little bit more than 10 minutes. So okay. as we talk about that, if you can move into the kind of action Absolutely. that people can take. I mean, I think we're sort of on the edge of talking about that because there are these actions that both of our organizations will do at times that are open to the general public, you know, right. to be there. But we have to make sure that you know about them. Yes. And, and so. you know, I know we've just sort of touched the scratch iceberg, the surface, right. scratch the surface of um, the social security issue. And again, as we talked about, you know, we are leaving our numbers at the bottom. Maybe if people have a lot of additional questions about social security, we can do this again. And, Absolutely. and talk about some of the other things yeah, that are going please on with social security. Let us know what questions didn't get answered for you today and we'll make, we, you know, an, another effort to really answer those questions because there's so much right um, and so much of it is very interesting really never we talked about the history but we didn't get into the details of Social Security and the cha actual changes so at any time I'm happy to come back and cover all those issues so um, let's talk about how we deal with the solvency I'm very excited to talk about um, the National Committee is launching a campaign to boost Social Security now um, and really what that's about is the president has taken the cuts out of his budget and for right now it looks like we're okay. It's a fight we'll continue to fight and make sure we're doing that. Um, but now what we need to talk about is the solvency mm -hmm. issue. And while it'll go 20 years, with small changes we can make it go 75 years and really finally take some of this argument off the table oh, about yes. solvency. Mm -hmm. Um, there are several ways to do it. Um, the Boost uh, Social Security campaign now is talks about sort of increasing the benefits, and not only just doing the solvency, but increasing the benefits. Because the fact is, we talked about how little Social Security is. We need to not only find ways to increase the solvency, but put a little bit more money into back people's in, into people's pockets. Mm -hmm. um, there are several options. I'll talk about one of the options. One is to um, increase the payroll tax slightly. Okay, as I said, people, you pay 6.2, your employer pays 6.2. Mm -hmm. Even if you changed it by only, let's say, 0.5 percent, right? You could increase the solvency by about 30 years. And when polled, a lot of young people actually strangely support this. And that would be, the, the idea would be that both the individual and the employer, the employer would, would have to make pay that more. increase. But as you can imagine, employers yeah, do not, not want to pay any mm -hmm. more about the match. Mm -hmm. um, so what the National Committee has been focused on is increasing, lifting the cap or increasing mm -hmm. the cap. Now, when Social Security was designed, it was... Um, about 90%, it was it was structured, the 6.2 would equal about 90% of um, people's income. 
Okay. Right. Um, but right now, it's only about 75% because what happens, and a lot of people don't know this, you only pay Social Security on about $110,000 of income. Right. Right? Now, you can see how in some As an individual. As an individual. So it make, might be 116 now, actually. So if you make more than that, which, like, most of us don't, but... So some people pay their, their whole working year. Throughout the whole year, they pay their Social Security. Now, they did... Um, there was this campaign called Fix the Debt that was in New Hampshire. I think, I did we talk it. about the last time? Yes, we did. Okay. The Fix the Debt campaign, the CEO of Honeywell was here in the state doing the Fix the Debt campaign. And the funny thing is... Which is a, one of those campaigns that sounds really good, but not no, so good. No, really. And, yeah, he, and they, be, they yeah. came to the table to talk about how to cut Social Security and Medicare. So this guy, the CEO of Honeywell, makes $24 million. He comes into work. He sits down at his desk, and he's already paid all his Social Security for the year, while the rest of us are paying the whole Every year. Day. Yeah. So the suggestion is that we lift the cap so that the percentage covers more of the income that it was expected to cover. So Does if that somebody's, make sense? Yeah, so if somebody's making a million dollars and um, and. and the person over here who's making, say, 50000 that person's going to keep paying all the time. Yes. But if somebody's making $2 million... They're probably they, done paying in January or February. January. Right. Maybe. And they're going to get... They're going to benefit from Social Security also to the degree they put in, more yeah. or less, right? Yeah. So and you get the money in that you put out. So what it would do is just put more money in the system. Right. Again, it's a social insurance. Think about buying insurance for your house, right? For fire insurance, right? You buy that insurance for your house. You're not hoping your house burns down. Right. <laughs> right? No. Social security is there when we need it. It's the insurance. It's the most solid, viable insurance program that exists. Think about that. Think about your car insurance or your house insurance. That's what it is, and it's there for you. Again, we don't pay our homeowner's insurance and hope that our house burns down. Right. We don't get car insurance hope we get a car to insurance. To the contrary. It's there when we need it, and that's what Social Security does. The Boost campaign is very exciting. People can go to our website. It'll be on the screen at the end, but it's www.ncpssm.org. And so just think, National Committee to Preserve, preserve Social Security and Medicare. Medicare. Medicare.org. Medicare. Right, and they okay. can go there. And what we're asking people to do, so talking about the action, we're supporting two bills. Um, a lot, what's interesting is that for the first time in a while, a lot of senators have start, and House representatives have started to get behind a couple of bills. This is on the federal level. And, mm -hmm. yep, on the federal level, have decided to get be behind a couple of bills to um, increase the the solvency and the amount that future mm -hmm. beneficiaries get. People like Elizabeth Warren, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Tom Harkin, Bernie Sanders, and Representatives Linda Sanchez and Gwen Moore. There are a couple bills out there. We're asking people to call their senators and representatives and ask them to support these bills. If it's your senator, it is, um, I gave you these bills before and now I'm, I'm I'm losing myself. So, so there's two bills in that. While you're looking for those numbers and names, so mm -hmm. Natasha's talking about putting calls in to Senator Ayotte, Senator Shaheen, Representative uh, Shea Porter, and Representative Custer. Right. So, so that's who it, these right. calls And in the Senate, to. you ask the senators to support Senate Bill 567, Okay, Senate Bill 567 at the Senate. Mm -hmm. And in the House, H.R. 3118. Okay? okay. And what we need them to do is HR sign on to those bills okay. so that, that these bills can be passed that will increase. The bills themselves will put about $70 additional money in people's mm -hmm. pockets, but also increase the solvency of Social Security. It's very exciting. It's something that's doable. 
we just need people to take action make those calls get them to sign on and tell them how important it is to you yeah and it's it's really not so scary to make those calls a lot of times people are afraid they need to know everything about something and it's sort of back to that simplicity that we talked about i put in i should be able to get out that's the way you don't have to feel that you must know absolutely every detail of a bill that you're asking your senators and representatives to support on both the federal and the state level. Um, and again, uh, the websites, picking up the phone and calling us for more information, we're, we're winding down here um, uh, in our time to be able to talk about this right now, but and, don't and be afraid to you know, to, to make those calls. And we, when we actually talked about this last week, Karen, people can tell their story. It's as simple right. as that and how right. important the story is. What, you know, why does Social Security matter to you? How important it is, is it to you? And if you can articulate that, whether it be in an email, a letter, a phone call to your senator and representative and say, these programs are important to me, this is why it's important to me, you can either say support this pill or I think it's important that we lift the cap increase social security benefits you can you know we're getting the message out there about boost now you can say i support the boost now campaign there you and go. they'll know what it is we're making it really simple but it's so important that you do it if we don't move these programs forward they will be cut and i you know i can't stress that enough how important this time is right now to take action to make a difference and to protect these programs. We need them that, now more that, than ever. Yes, and uh, you know, before we sign off with Natasha, we also have some bills in the Senate, in the, in the state that also need attention. Um, the, the one that we talked about before, Senate Bill 413, that has that health protection program. Um, even though we're optimistic about it, calling your House representative, your state representative, is a good thing to do to reinforce. Our representatives like to know that you have their back, that they are acting in your best interest. And we also have two other pieces of legislation that have now passed the House and are moving into the Senate. The Senate is a little trickier. One is on pay equity. Um, and we won't be able to go into it too much, but it's House Bill 1188. Um, uh, oops, I'm, yes, okay, it passed the House. And also on minimum wage, raising the minimum wage um, gradually to $9 um, is another one. And that one is um, House Bill 4, 1403. So we need to have calls to our senators, our state senators, to support those two bills. And you can go to our websites, we're running out of time, so Natasha, I just have to thank you so much for being here, and thanks to our producer, Jerry O'Connor, yeah, today he's gonna be O'Connor because it's St. Patrick's <laughs> Day. Jerry Connor and Wayne Dutch, our director, and all the people that are helping us out here. And I think you have a closing thought, but. I'm going to say thank you as you close out. Yes, I want to say again, thank you so much for having me. As I said before, if people want have more questions about Social Security, we're happy to come back and talk about it and call people about that um, pay, pay equity, minimum wage, pay equity, equity, because what you pay in, you get out. And raising people's wages helps Social Security. In the end, it's all tied together. Great. Well, thank you again. And see you next time.